Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, The Future of Active Host Vulnerability Monitoring. My name is Amy, and I'm in the marketing team here at Lacework, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand after today's live presentation. Uh, also on the right-hand side of your screen around there, you should see some related content specific to today's topic. Feel free to download any of that, click out and check any of those out to take with you. Uh, this webcast is also meant to be interactive, so feel free to submit any questions in the Q&A box, and we'll save some time at the end to answer your questions. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get started. With me today, I have Abner, who is our VP of Product Marketing over here at Lacework. All right, over to you, Abner. Awesome. Well, thanks, Amy. It's, uh, it's exciting to, to have so many of you here today. And I'm lucky enough to be joined by uh, Michael Bentley, who is the product manager that, that helped build a, a good chunk of this. And so uh, between the two of us, we're going to uh, walk you through what's, what's going to happen and, um, and the future of vulnerability management. And so uh, Michael, say hi and so people know your voice. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so in terms of what we're going to do today, we're going to spend uh, a little bit of time talking about Lacework and uh, fairly importantly, who, th who this is for. So what, you know, who, who fits the profile of, um, of, of needing modern vulnerability management in the cloud. And then we're going to dive into uh, basically both the, the problem and the solution in terms of, um, first of all, how do you figure out what needs to be fixed in a large scale cloud environment? Um, how do you do things like shift left to avoid vulnerabilities in your cloud in the first place? Um, and then how to deal with the constant change of new CVEs that show up all the time. So to, to kick that off, uh, let's just talk a little bit about uh, lace work and, and kind of how we view the world and the, the problems that we solve. So you know the cloud changes constantly, and, and that's by design. And there's, there's lots of different uh, containers scaling up and down. You have a zillion different services that have you know 100 APIs each, and lots of different people working on all of those systems at the same time. And so you know when we look at uh, how do you extract data out of the cloud and 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 make sense out of it from a security perspective? Uh, you know, we look at everything from the the cloud activities to the uh, the infrastructure and the configurations of the of the infrastructure that you run, and then uh, the application relationships themselves. And of course, today we're going to spend time on, um, on on talking about infrastructure and the configurations and the uh, the vulnerabilities that, that we'll find. Uh, one of the big problems that we see in the, the cloud security market is a, a lack of context. So, you know, anytime something happens, uh, and it could be a, uh, an attack, it could be something, you know, some developer doing something that's well-intentioned but outside the guardrails. And so the, the who, what, when, why, and how of what happens in the cloud is, is oftentimes buried in a log file somewhere or siloed away in a security tool that's, that's very difficult to, to navigate. And so you know, one of our customers put this, <laughs> I thought, very nicely. He calls it the mean time to WTF. How long does it take you to figure out what's happening inside uh, your cloud environment and, and make sense of it? And so uh, what Lacework does is uh, we toil around that data. We stitch all the context together so that you don't have to. Basically, we ingest lots of data. It could be your CloudTrail logs uh, for cloud activity, or it could be agent data, which is what we'll be talking about today from your, uh, your hosts or your containers or your clusters. Uh, and we map that activity. We, we find all the relationships in that, uh, and then we analyze those activities to do things like figure out uh, anomalies and, and other patterns that are worth spending time on so that we can then provide you with, uh, with very deep context and, and actions in terms of alerts that don't suck, and we'll talk more about those, uh, answers to auditors, and, and then today what we're going to talk about is uh, vulnerabilities. So you know, in terms of how do we fit in with, uh, with 
what you do. Um, the bottom part of this slide is fairly impossible to read, but uh, it speaks to all the different capabilities that, uh, that we offer out of the platform. Um, and the point here is really that if you are operating in the cloud at any level of scale, uh, we can probably help you, and, um, and, but we'll grow with you. So you don't have to buy the whole thing all at once. You can start out with uh, a, a couple of different angles, and, um, and we can do things like ingest your data from, uh, from the cloud activity or the agent data. Uh, the other important bit, of course, and, and so what we're going to be talking today is, is that agent data and, um, and both the uh, vulnerability assessment of uh, containers and hosts uh, before they are deployed, um, and then host uh, vulnerability once they are live in your environment. Um, of course, the other cool thing is that we also work with uh, all the other tools that you have in your CI/CD pipeline and performance monitoring and alerting and, and logging tools. So who is this for? Well, um, what we've built is really for anyone who is scaling uh, Linux hosts in the cloud. Uh, if you're also using containers or you're focused on containers, then um, we, we also have a, a parallel offering for you that's all on the same platform for containers. But what we're going to be talking about today is, is hosts. And what we find is that this is very good for anyone who either doesn't have a vulnerability management program um, or they have a fairly sophisticated vulnerability management program for a, a product like a B2B SaaS uh, service that you're running in, in the cloud. And so if you don't have a vulnerability management program, but uh, you have a lot of host images, uh, those host images are, um, are, are cycling fairly rapidly, they're, they're ephemeral, they're scaling up and down, uh, or they're immutable, you're replacing them. Um, and then if you also need threat detection or uh, service relationship visibility between your applications and your infrastructure, um, then, then this is a really nice uh, added bonus for you. Um, what we're not going to talk about today and what this isn't built for is what I would call the sort of the, the very traditional enterprise-wide vulnerability compliance program where uh, you've got lots of laptops and uh, kind of doing network scans of on-prem infrastructure. That's not where we're spending your time. So if that's totally your gig, um, thanks for joining and, and you know, feel free to <laughs> feel, feel free to stick around if you want to know what's going on in the cloud. Um, but that's not what we've built this for. We've really built this for uh, for companies who are uh, trying to either get get going or they they need to consolidate tooling because uh, what's been built for them in the past doesn't work for for a large scale cloud environment. So um, so. You know, I think one of the things that's important to to talk about uh, when it comes to vulnerabilities are containers versus hosts. And so, uh, Michael, maybe step us through a little bit of, um, of of what this looks like and and sort of how we think about uh, the the pets versus cattle and and containers and and hosts and and how they all fit together. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, so when we were building this product, uh, we actually uh, partnered with a, a customer for limited beta, and they had all of these kind of features in their environment. They had pets, cattle, and containers. So they, their pets were, you know, these, in their case, this is a Ubuntu host that they kept uh, around for somewhere between 60 and 80 days. These are systems that are running, you know, their databases, or it's a load balancer. Um, you know, they're not replacing these very often. Um, but if you have, uh, you know, a compliance requirement around, say, critical or high vulnerabilities, well, then you have to go in there and address these hosts. Somebody has to, you know, log in or go in through automation, say, I'm going to um, update these, whether they, that's a, you know, app get update or remove, you have to figure out what you're going to do. Um, that represents kind of a, a smaller portion of what we're seeing, though, in, in, in the cloud. What we're seeing a lot of our, our cattle, and these are, you know, the hosts that are, are creating the massive numbers for hosts. These are the hosts where, you know, we have uh, customers who have 5,000 running machines at any given time, and they're cycling out, say, 2,000 of these machines a day. Um, you know, these hosts are typically immutable. They're being used with, like, blue-green deployments and, say, like, Elastic Beanstalk or something like that, where they come and go. Um, nobody's really going into these as much and, and, and patching these. With, you know, what people are targeting is they're saying, uh, we have a problem with this, these, these cattle. 
we're going to fix the um, the AMI or the upstream you know image, and then the next time these hosts uh, come back online, they'll have that that new image. It's it's it, it's much more comfortable uh, a place for customers to be working on 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 those cattle we're finding. Um, and then we see containers where it's very similar to cattle. You know, you're not logging into your container and adding a new layer to to create a patch. Uh, you you know you're either finding a way to update your base layer that introduced that problem. Uh, or, or handling it further upstream. So cattle containers, uh, you know, disposable, uh, you're updating that image, pets, that's where you're having to actually go in and update uh, these systems. Awesome. So I think the, the, other, the other big thing before we, we dive into sort of like the, the uh, telemetry and what needs to, to happen um, is, is basically just the contrast between uh, how you used to build a uh, vulnerability management uh, entity and then uh, what we do today. So, you know, historically, uh, you would go build out a vulnerability infrastructure. You would, uh, that might be in a, in a data center, you would spin up, you know, you'd go acquire hardware. Uh, in the cloud, it might be, it mean going and, and building out a, a set of instances, um, going and deploying uh, dedicated agents and scheduling the scans around how you do that. Um, and there's this sort of, this word scan, which is classic to the, um, uh, to the vulnerability management system from when we used to scan uh, networks. Uh, but now uh, with Lacework, uh, what we do is basically just deploy an agent with any infrastructure automation tool. Uh, that agent just does a little bit. It, it figures out what's the operating system and the operating system version. And then we enumerate the package manage, uh, manager inventory. So we see what are the packages that are that are running and active on the uh, on the host, and then send that data to Lacework. So after you deploy the agent, um, you can then go get coffee, and and you don't have to do anything else in order to to get up and running. Uh, the agent does do some other things, like uh, collect some DNS and application process data for uh, for threat detection, but from a vulnerability standpoint, it's it's very very lightweight. And it's actually light, very lightweight overall, um, but it's there's none of that processing actually occurs on your host. So let's dive into uh, what everybody asks about cloud host vulnerabilities. So the first question is, what should I fix in prod? How do I figure out what what needs to be fixed? Um, then there's the shift left beats of how you how can we develop on better host images? How can we improve the quality of the uh, the host? And then how do you deal with constant change and in the in the environment? So let's dive into the first one. Um, what if what to fix? What telemetry do you need to find the vulnerabilities that actually matter? And when we when we go here, um, I think the first place to to acknowledge is that in the cloud um, we have ephemeral hosts that are that are cycling, and um, and they're online and they're offline. And so, uh, you know, specific to to what we've looked at, um, Michael, maybe walk us through our definitions for online and offline, and and kind of what they look like. Yeah. So the when when I mentioned uh, earlier that you know we we partnered with a customer who has around 5,000 hosts online, you know at, at any given time, and they're cycling out 2,000. You know, it ranged between 500 and 2,500 hosts a day. So if you're on you know Monday, you have 5,000 hosts, and then on Tuesday you cycle out 2,000. We now have 7,000 uh, artifacts from this. And if you uh, identify, you know, for example, like a critical vulnerability in your environment. Uh, and you, you now have these 7,000 things in front of you, you have to have some form of data to say, like, how am I going to get this many things done? I can't, you know, like my team is only so big. So what we do is because we have that agent, we give you the ability to actually determine what machines are online right now with these vulnerabilities and, and which ones uh, are not online. With the intention being, if you have a major or critical vulnerability, your time is probably going to be best served, you know, analyzing what its impact is to production, uh, what live systems are affected versus literally an inventory of vulnerabilities uh, for machines that are offline and may never come back. You know, when you have these ephemeral hosts, uh, many of the times they just, they never come back. You know, when you, you do that blue green deployment, uh, you'll just have uh, often a new image will come up. Um, even if you do have an image that shows back up, it's still very, very short lived. So being able to filter out 
what machines are online and what are offline is a, a really powerful feature for just drilling down to what do I need to do right now. Yeah, so if we if we look at like what does that actually look like in practice, um, you know, if I have uh, if I have lots and lots of hosts that are both online and offline, um, you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to filter that down. And so this is a, a screenshot of of just the the, the online hosts um, and the the ones that have been uh, been online for a bit. So, uh, but that's not enough, right? Like just seeing what's online. Um, kind of clues me into to the, the fact of, okay, where are these vulnerabilities? Um, but I probably need to go deeper than that. Uh, I also need to figure out, like, when, you know, when are these things running and, um, and, and how often are, is that intelligence going to pop up? So, so, Michael, maybe run us through uh, when we find the vulnerability in the first place and, and kind of what that ongoing... Um, uh, I'll use air quotes, scan looks like. Oop, did we lose Michael? We might have lost Michael. All oh. right, I'll do it then. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there you no, go. That was me. <laughs> uh, when I think about when I was doing vulnerability management, you know, kind of historically before I was using like a tool like place where if I had 5,000 hosts on, you know, Monday and then I cycled out 2,000 hosts, well, I, I, I now have 7,000 uh, uh, assessments. And as you like, you continue forward over time, you end up with like literally a million artifacts where you're trying to go, okay, well, what happened on, on June 17th and where am I at now? And where does this line up? And how do I even get this scheduled to, you know, even get an assessment? We, we got rid of uh, all of all of that burden in the way. What happens is, is you install the agent. Um, when you install that agent, we get you an assessment as soon as possible, typically within the first hour. Um, so, you know, you have that agent, you get your assessment. Once you have that first assessment for the next, you know, uh, for, for the lifetime of this host, as long as this host stays on, you know, uh, online, it's not, you know, you don't, you don't get rid of that host. We're just going to carry those assessments for you forever. So if you brought on that host at, you know, 7 a.m., You'll have your assessment at, you know, at 8 something a.m. And then every day after that, or about 3 a.m., you're going to get your updated assessment, which is going to be that continuous assessment. And what I mean when I say we carry it forward is I mean you have one assessment for a host, uh, regardless of how long it lives. If that host is online for, say, 30 days or, you know, it's like your, your, your pets and it's online for three months, you're not having to look at, uh, at multiple artifacts of, of, of assessment. You're not having to look at 10 or 20 different PDF reports. There's a single report in there uh, that goes all the way back to your initial assessment that says, you know, here's how long the problem has been around. Here's when we discovered the problem. Here's when you fix the problem. Awesome. So when we take it, and then and then to take that a step further, the other thing that I'm going to care about is um, is basically how do I how do I manage right down to the severity of the vulnerability. So here we have it filtered by uh, the severity of the vulnerability in the in the UI. We'll show this in the API in just a just a minute. Um, and uh, and then if I can make this go. Um, and then the other bit that's that's interesting is because Lacework has the uh, a, a lot of different data around the, the location and deployment nature of the host. Uh, we can also filter it by the, the image um, or any kind of tag or attribute, like does it have an external IP? Um, and so that telemetry can get you right down to, uh, to, to understanding which images matter and, um, and, and which hosts you, you really care about. Um, it, and that, what? Go ahead. I would say on that filtering and on that the AMI filtering, that was really helpful for um, our, our our customers that we were working on this with because because they have all these ephemeral hosts over you know the course of you know two months they'll end up with forty eight thousand offline hosts and then they're you know they're not even looking at those they, so we're helping them remove that with the online 
Then we come in, we help them filter it by critical and high, you know, to what they, they have to respond to. And then even though you filter on critical and high, uh, we had a, a customer that still had 51,000 high vulnerabilities, which like when, when I see that, you know, if I'm on a vulnerability management team, I'm actually like, oh my goodness, how am I actually going to tackle this? But when you actually take those, those, those cattle and you group them by AMI, you quickly find out that, oh, wow, uh, we only have a few images we need to update here. We don't have to update. We don't have to go in and patch 51,000 high vulnerabilities. We need to go and patch uh, one or two images. Uh, and being able to filter that in helps you figure out how am I going to work, you know, uh, with better data uh, on that side. It also helps you do things like say, what are my most exposed networks? So, you know, many of our customers have tags by, by VPC. So you can start to group things like here's all my critical vulnerabilities by network segment. Right. And there's certain network segments that I'm going to care a lot about because they're uh, production facing and then some that are, you know, development environments and other places that I might not care about quite as much. So, um, you know, very powerful to be able to, to focus in on, on those hosts. Um, but the host itself, uh, like, there's, there's still a lot of software packages on a host. And so the, the next piece of telemetry that you need is to understand what's actually running on the host and, and, and what's, what's happening. So, uh, so, Michael, maybe walk us through, like, the package status and uh, an active package versus one that's, that's not and, and a little bit around what we can see and what we can't. So part of the things that, you know, we do in addition to vulnerability monitoring is we also do, you know, process monitoring. What are the processes that, um, uh, how are they interacting within your environment? Because we already have that data, uh, you know, at the platform level, we can bring that process usage into vulnerability assessments. So, you know, when you say, okay, I had 51,000 high vulnerabilities, but that actually only came down to uh, four AMIs, we give you the ability to even go further on, on how you're going to prioritize which one you fix first by giving the information on which processes are you actually using. So how that matters is, is if you have an active process, uh, but you have a high vulnerability on it, uh, you may not have the ability to actually remove um, that process. You know, if it's something you're using, you can't just maybe, you know, app get remove it. Maybe you have to, um, you have to look for a fixed version or you'll have to come up with a compensating control. So knowing that the process is in use helps you understand what your options are. If the process is not in use, well, then you have other options that are available. Maybe it's something that you don't use at all and, and you can just simply remove this from the AMI. So being able to continually drill down into how can I use the data that Lave's work is providing to, to do the least amount of work possible to achieve the goals that I want. That's what we're giving here. Awesome. And so in terms of like what does that actually look like, um, there are lots of different ways to, to sort and filter on this. And uh, it's super hard to see, but um, we can even get right down to, uh, to, to, to showing you which level of um, which package it is and, uh, and, and click through to find the, the vendor's fix. So the, the CVE data that we, that we pull into this and, and match to, to each of these um, can show you exactly what's happening and um, and exactly which package and whether or not it's fixable, because that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, as Michael mentioned, it's, it's one thing to, to find it, but, but then um, how do you analyze the fix and, and understand that? Uh, and then very importantly, collaborate with other people on that, uh, on that fix. So um, where we have, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say where we ha actually have the package status, we also show you the file path there. Where does this actually exist on your host? And this will help with your incident responders. So let's say that there's an incident that you're, you're dealing with and your incident responders not in your GRC group. Um, how are they gonna know that there's a vulnerability on this host? Because we tie all this together in the platform. If you were, if an incident responder were to actually come through on our, our machine processes page, uh, because we have that file path that you see there and this process is actually active, we'll, we'll show that in the rest of the product too. So if you're looking at live processes, we'll say, here are the ones that actually have vulnerabilities wherever you are in the product. Awesome. So, um, so let's talk about the, the, the vulnerability lifecycle itself. There's the, um, so once we've found it, then like, what do we do with it, <laughs> right? Um, so, so maybe talk through how we define uh, the vulnerabilities in the product so that, um, you know, because there's this, uh, you know, once I find it, then, um, you know, maybe I want to suppress it or maybe I want to make sure that I, I know it's fixed. 
Yeah, so when we run that first assessment, that initial assessment, um, any vulnerabilities that we find in there are going to be marked as new. It's the first time we've seen it on, on this host and in your environment. Um, if a new vulnerability was available via the CVE databases that we use, well, then we would also say it's new. So new is the first time we've seen it on that host and, and in, uh, uh, in, in your environment. On the next assessment, so when it runs uh, uh, the next day, we'll just show it as active. So as long as that vulnerability is live and we've seen it in more than one assessment, we're going to show it inactive throughout that life cycle until you fix this vulnerability. Now, you have multiple options to fix it. You know, you can, you can apply the fixed version, which doesn't have the vulnerability, uh, or you could just remove um, that, that, uh, that binary from the host, and that would also be a fix if it no longer exists. Uh, so you'll transition from new to active to fixed. Um, we're adding the ability so that if you have a regression, something happens, uh, and you go back into reopened, uh, we'll, we'll have a reopen status for you. Right now, the show is active, uh, but we are adding the, the reopen status. Uh, and you'll be able to see that something has been fixed in the UI. So I, I've run into this problem before when I was doing vulnerability management. You, uh, you discover a vulnerability, someone fixes it, and uh, the data that you get in your next scan is just null. It's just absence of data, and you're like, well, is it, is it gone? I don't know, you know, just because it's not in the report. So we'll actually carry forward that it's been fixed uh, for, for a week so that you can see, you know, every day you have that reinforcement that, hey, this has actually been resolved. This is no longer a problem. I don't need to, to worry about it. Awesome. So one of the things that uh, a couple people have asked is, as we've been walking through the UI is, is this available in the, um, in, through the API as well? And the answer to that is, is yes, of course. Uh, we have a, a, a wonderful API for, for this, and, and we'll, we'll talk both about the API uh, and the, the CLI um, capabilities on, around live. So you know, if, I'm, if I want to understand what's happening in my live environment, I want to see all my CVEs, uh, I, can, I can do that. Um, I can also go down to a very specific machine, um, and I can go to, uh, it, you know, or I'm sorry, I could go, I could look for a specific CVE, or I can look at a specific machine. Um, on the container side, I can do things like look at a specific registry. If you know I'm a developer and I just want to look at the registry that that I care about, I can do that. Um, and so we have a, a fairly flexible uh, CLI that allows us to look at um, a variety of different angles. Um, Michael, just while I'm on this site, anything interesting in terms of the output that you get from the the API that you think people should know? All right. I'm going to translate. I think we lost Michael for a second. I'm going to translate that as it's awesome and um, and and really fun to play with. There's some uh, some some great examples on our documentation site around um, sort of different uh, examples of of queries that you can run and and what that output looks like uh, and and different ways of integrating that with your CI/CD pipeline. Um, we actually talked about this a little bit in terms of what does the uh, the evaluation look like. So when you first deploy the the host, uh, we basically check to see if it's a supported OS. Um, if it is, and the, the host has been alive for you know less than two hours, um, then we'll run that that first evaluation, and then after that, uh, it's a, a 3 a.m. local time uh, evaluation today. So, uh, so let's move now to to the ability to shift left and deploy on better host images. Uh, one of the questions that you know that that we've seen in terms of like, okay, on containers you can uh, scan a registry and that's great, and so that oftentimes prevent vulnerabilities from making it into production. Um, but what about hosts? Can we can we can we get to those vulnerabilities before they go into production? And so. Uh, there, there are two different ways that we can uh, that we see people using this, and um, and so Michael, if you're back, you can dive in. Otherwise, yep. I will. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. I'm back. Uh, so <laughs> you, you, you know, we, we we talked about earlier. You have the agent, and you have uh, uh, your host assessment, but at that point, you've already deployed this AMI somewhere. It's having an impact. Maybe that's in prod. Maybe that's in QA. It, it exists somewhere. 
how can you know what your risk is before you actually deploy this image? Uh, how can you, uh, you know, in, ensure you know what you're getting into? So um, what we're doing actually here at Lacework is when we build an, an, an image, so if you're using something like uh, uh, HashiCorp Packer, uh, you build that AMI, uh, you know, that's going to be when, uh, you know, you're adding things like maybe you have a logging agent you add. That's going to be when you add your, 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 your Lacework agent. Maybe you have some universal libraries that you need to add for, uh, uh, for your entire company. When you're putting that in, you also query the Lacework API. And what you query the Lacework API with is you say, here's my OS and here's my, my package manifest. Here's what, you know, we have installed. And we'll give you, uh, we will compute in real time for you. Here's what your vulnerabilities are before you've actually deployed this anywhere. How you can use this, how we see customers using this is when they build their images, they're actually creating that artifact so that they can say, hey, look, we, we have one high vulnerability in here. Uh, uh, we, can't, we can't go live with this. So before they actually introduce that, they're knowing what their CVs, CVEs are. Further down the line, um, you know, let's say you have your developers. Your developers are picking up that golden image. Um, and let's say you're doing image processing. Uh, your developer is, and then maybe they're using like image magic or something like that. So they wrote their program uh, in, in Python. They also have to do like a uh, an app get install for image magic because they need that that binary for the image magic library in Python to work. When they install the image magic, they may have actually added a vulnerability at that point. Uh, so we have customers that are also as a part of the you know the kind of developer life cycle. They're also querying the Lacework API. Here are the packages that I added uh, with you know with apt or with yum. Uh, let me know what risk we've introduced. Uh, and then we also see people using this as a, a pre prod check. Let's just you know make sure. So we see people operating across all all, all portions of the the life cycle for that image. Uh, uh, where ops is building the image, where uh, developers are enhancing that image and where QA is deploying it to their environment. Awesome. So, so let's talk about what you actually get on that on-demand assessment and, and like what do you send and, and what, what comes out of that. Yep. So we use a, a blocking API. So what I mean when I say blocking API is, is you make your, your post request and then it, it takes two or three seconds and you get a response. Uh, we're not giving you like a job ID where you got to come back and check on it. So uh, you make a post to a blocking API, uh, you include in that payload, uh, you know, uh, here's my uh, OS inversion. This is, you know, like literally running LSB release. We'll get you this information on Ubuntu. Uh, and then, you know, you can run, a, you know, dpackage release, uh, uh, a dpackage list, and that'll give you what's installed. You send that, you can send up to 1,000 packages at a time. If you have more than 1,000 packages, then you just need two requests. Um, we're actually giving 20 requests an hour on this. Uh, keep in mind, we're computing a ton of data for this. We're comparing you against the whole CVE database on the fly uh, 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 with, with what your risks are going to be. So you, you, you make that payload, you query the API. As long as your payload's valid, uh, we'll give you a response back that is stateless. What I mean by stateless is we're not updating any assessments that you have uh, associated with, with machines uh, that you have agents installed on. So if you were to, say, install an agent, uh, you were to get an assessment on that host that has that agent, and then you also use a scan API, the scan API is not going to update that, that assessment. The data that you're getting back with this, this is the same data that we use to build your assessment. So we're, we're giving you everything here that you would get with an agent assessment, but the ability to do it up front before you deploy. Awesome. That's just wonderful. And here's the, here's the actual example of, of what you get. Uh, I don't know if there's anything specific that you want to call out here other than it's Super easy and and fairly intuitive. Um. Yeah, so everything in here. So it, it, it's got where where did we see this issue? Um, we're going to include uh, all the feature keys. We actually want you to know how we actually derive this information, so that you know if you see like we have those feature keys that say here's the name, here's the namespace we use, here's the the version, here's our compare results. We we want to to enable you to know like here's everything that we did along the way to get this information, and then all those CVE props. That's the same data that you would have in the UI when you did that twirl down to investigate the CVE. What's the description? Where did you get it from? What are the scores? What's my fixed version? We include all of that in here, everything that you need. Awesome. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you want to um, build this into your, your process, uh, here's an example of, of doing that with HashiCorp Packer. Uh, and you know, we can build it into to pretty much anything that, um, that any kind of pipeline that, that you're building. So, uh, so let's keep moving here. Let's go to, to what happens when, uh, when we have constant changes and, and even mistakes. 
and you know the the world is not static. There's uh, there's always a, a new CVE on the front page of, uh, of of Hacker News and you know other other places about how the the world is falling apart. Um, and so you know, or people are constantly deploying new machines and maybe not going through the the process that we want them to go through. Um, but then you know, also things are changing uh, in terms of the severity of a. Uh, of, a, of a CVE and fixes are showing up where they didn't exist before. And so the, um, the way that we solve for that is uh, we'll actually alert you on, on those changes. So if something's new, then uh, we can alert you on that uh, based on the severity level of, um, of, of that criticality. Uh, if something gets you know, redeployed and um, or, you know, Somebody doesn't do the, the upfront scan, and they deploy something that's that's vulnerable into the environment. Uh, we can alert you to that as well. Um, and then, you know, if, if there's a severity change uh, or a fix becomes available, uh, those are other alert options that that you can choose from. And so, I think you know, while while that's super cool, one of the other you know sort of very consistent things that you'll see from from Lacework is that each one of those alerts uh, comes with uh, one, it, it, it rides alongside any other alert that we get um, from a, um, you know, inside the Lacework system. So if there's an event that's, that's weird, if there's a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, anomaly in your environment or a, uh, a rule violation, uh, we see that. And you may be thinking, okay, uh, you know that's actually not a great thing to have all my alerts, uh, you know, inter intermixed with uh, with with everything else. And um, what I will tell you is that uh, because Lacework does the the mapping and the activities, our alert volumes are far far less than uh, than what you would experience historically in in a security tool. So uh, so you know it's it's not something that you're going to be overwhelmed by. Um, it's very easy to sort and filter. And then what's in the alert itself is um, is, is very powerful. So uh, it's pretty much impossible to read here, but the um, the, the lower right is uh, a set of checks that we go through in terms of determining um, kind of the, the basic first couple of steps that you would go through if you were investigating this as a um, as a breach, and uh, and then you know all the data that. Uh, that, that shows up in, in other places uh, that, that we've already covered. Um, but if we dive into the, the actual payload of the alert itself, uh, this particular alert is, uh, is on a container vulnerability as opposed to a host vulnerability, but they all look the same. Uh, what we see up here is, uh, and I can't read because the screen is too small. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Michael, can you, can you describe what's actually in this? I literally can't read it. And my eyes are going because I'm old. We, we give you the why. So that's, you know, why did this even match something? So this is, a, you know, you, the, the alert policy that you created uh, um, where it says, you know, hey, I want critical or I want uh, uh, critical and high. Uh, the what, it's going to be, what was the application affected? What are the vulnerability so that we're, that we're, we're seeing uh, and, and, and what hosts are, are impacted with this? And then the when is we're going to, you know, this is the first time we saw that. But there's also the event time. Are, you know, are we still seeing this? So we always try and give you the why, the what, the when, uh, the how, so that you can always figure out where did this come from? Why do I care? And, and what should I do about it? That's the data that's going to be in here. And then it's also going to link you to other related events that may be occurring in your environment because it's platform and it's everything integrated across uh, all of our features. Awesome. So, uh, so, so with that, you know, I think the uh, I, I hope what you've seen here is the the future of vulnerability telemetry in the cloud. Um, you know, there's the, I think one of the things that's that's really important to understand is that the workflows are fairly different from uh, today's vulnerability tools, uh, and and hopefully what you've seen is uh, has gotten you fairly excited around. Uh, you know, understanding vulnerabilities in a cloud environment, uh, workflows that work with the way that your team works, uh, the ability to have that live view into uh, package ex execution, and and really focused on uh, improving your 
your security posture. So it's uh, it's one thing to sort of know that you have a lot of vulnerabilities. It's another to uh, actually deal with where you're vulnerable. Um, so to, to wrap up, uh, you know, Lacework can, can grow with you. Uh, the telemetry to find risks is, is both easy to use and, um, and very, very flexible. Uh, hosts can shift left too, as, as well as containers. Uh, and the alerts can keep you focused on your business as opposed to, to trying to figure out um, what's happening in your environment. So with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions. We have a few in the um, in the question Q&A bar already. And uh, let's see. So, um, so one of the questions is, uh, let's see, is Laceworks Agent a full EDR tool? Um, so, uh, so Paul, no, the, the, so Lacework is, is not a, an EDR tool. We don't, um, we don't go on laptops and, um, and, and sort of do endpoint production. Um, we're really focused on cloud infrastructure and uh, ephemeral infrastructure that, that scales up and down, whether it's hosts or containers. So uh, the, the sort of classic definition of EDR in, um, in kind of the broader enterprise isn't where we're focused, uh, but we do do uh, threat detection and incident response data for, um, for, for your cloud infrastructure, uh, as well as um, cloud activity and, and, and other, um, other telemetry that gets you at uh, what you need to know about what's happening inside your cloud. Uh, let's see, so uh, we have the question, how do I ensure we get the agent on every host? Golden AMIs are great, but we need to find uh, those that aren't using them. Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. So um, I think there, there are probably two ways to do that. One is, uh, you know, step one is, is starting to build the agent into your, your monitoring hosts and uh, the same way that you would build an agent into your, um, you know, a Datadog or a New Relic infrastructure agent or, or any of those and, um, and, and understand what was um, and, and, and in order to see what's there. Uh, we do have, there are some capabilities to figure out like kind of what's the difference between your agent footprint and the rest of your environment. And so um, uh, we'd love to have a conversation around uh, specifically how to do that in, in your environment. Uh, and we also okay. have in the, yeah. uh, the UI a, car, a card for that where we show a, uh, hosts that don't have agents installed if we're uh, integrated with the cloud config. We oh, that's right. That I totally forgot. Well. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you, you, but you do have to have the agent to detect. Um, the agent has to be in the environment to detect uh, whether or not the agent is running on the host. So you have to have at least one agent in the environment. Um, is all the CVA, CVE data available via the API, how are false positives vetted out along with a customized CVSS score based on attack vectors that the host has? For example, if an instance isn't public, then it won't, wouldn't be vulnerable to certain vulns. All right, so I'll take the last one. Um, uh, so I, we, we did show how you can filter the, uh, the host to uh, to understand uh, which ones have uh, public uh, IPs versus those that don't. Um, and then, uh, Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the CVE data and false positives and, and the potential of uh, customizing the, the CVE score? Sure. So um, on the CVE data, is the CVE data available via the API? Any CVE that exists in your environment is available via the API. So you can say, show me all CVEs for hosts that are online. Show me all critical CVEs. So there's a few ways to, um, to also filter on that data. Uh, as far as customized CVSS scores, we use the CVSS scores directly from the, uh, the upstream CVE uh, 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 provider. So if Ubuntu says, uh, on their feed says this is the CVSS score. We that's what we use. If uh, AWS's feed for Amazon Linux says 
here is the CVSS score. That's what we provide. Um, now, you mentioned saying, okay, well, what if I have a host that's not public? Um, earlier in the presentation, we talked about adding suppression. We'll be adding suppression that also works with a, a tag so that you can say, this, is, this doesn't have a, a public IP, so you know, ignore this type of, of uh, event or, or detection. So we'll be tackling that through um, uh, suppression. Uh, on the custom, you know, the, I think the intent of the question on customized scores, um, customized risk scores are something I've, I've always struggled with because environments are always moving, they're always changing, and it seems like, uh, you know, in my experience, that customized risk scores are kind of a Band-Aid on the greater problem, which is the vulnerability tool, the management tool didn't give us enough data to actually create prioritization, so we need this other prioritization tool. By providing the ability to filter on online, offline hosts, uh, um, you know, the tags that are in, you know, on your machines, uh, what's actually active in your environment, our, our goal there is to reduce your reliance on risk-based scoring and actually just have that data up front to say, this is what's happening right now on the things that we care about that we have to fix. Awesome. Um, so then there's a question about the performance impact on, on the host where the agent is installed. So the answer to that is uh, typically what we see is uh, under a 2% performance impact. It's, it's often much less than that. Uh, the performance impact of the, the vulnerability side is basically nil because all we're doing is, is the, the inventory. Um, but for the threat detection side, um, there is a little bit we run in the user space and um, and, and sort of outside the kernel, so uh, so we don't impact that, which is unique for some security tools. And uh, and there's a there's a good FAQ on our site around um, just the the behavior of the agent. So uh, I encourage you to go take a look at that, and um, and we'll we'll post that as well. All right. Uh, I think those are all the questions. I want to thank everybody for, for asking such awesome questions. Um, uh, you know, if, we'd love to follow up with you. We'd love to, to learn more about how to, to make this work. Um, if, you have, if you think of other questions afterwards, feel free to, to reach out. Uh, there's chat on our website. There's uh, a variety of different ways. If we if we haven't reached out to you already, we're we're happy to do that and and talk about the the way that we can fit into your environment and um, and make all of you successful. So uh, thank you for all your questions. Thank you for coming today. Uh, thank you for being part of the the cloud generation and and building uh, really awesome applications that we can go secure. So uh, with that, have a great day. Oh, and thanks to Michael for being awesome today. Thank you.